as promised earlier uh, in the day, we have a lot of questions. So this panel title itself is a question. Is there a winning business model in Bharat? AKA Dhanda, AKA Show Me The Money. Um, to lead this panel, I would like to invite Eric Savage, co-founder and CEO of Unitas Capital on stage. To join Eric, I would like to invite Mega Bhagat, co-founder and chief growth officer at Project DeFi, and Prashant Venkatramana, co-founder and director, Smart Global. So in this panel, the idea is to cover the simple question, is there a winning business model? Will there ever be a winning business model? Should they be tech or non-tech based businesses? Should they be for profits, non-profits? And for entrepreneurs operating in Bharat, should they be wired differently than the ones operating in urban market? So Eric, over to you. Great, Th thanks a lot, uh, Shrikant. It's a, certainly a pleasure to be here and, and fantastic that, uh, that NASCOM is focusing on this, uh, on this sector. I'm also pleased to say that I know this is going to be a successful panel because uh, I received an email this morning and uh, the email was some from someone named Sumit, I won't say the full name, it must be an oracle, as it said, kudos on your inspiring speech at NASCOM today. And then uh, went on to tell me how much they enjoyed the speech and uh, were, you know, wanted to follow up and have a discussion on some of the things talked about. So, so I'm, we're already kind of guaranteed <laughs> of success here. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, um, but, it, but, it, no, but it is a pleasure to be here and, it, and, it's, and it's great that we're talking about this, this topic. Um, I, th I think what, um, what we'll do first is we'll, we'll have each of the panelists um, briefly ex explain w what we do so that you have an understanding of where we're coming from. And then we'll get into the heart of these questions on you know, how and can you win in, in Bharat and in, in, rural, in rural India. Um, and, and I think it's important that when we, when we say rural that we know we're talking about. I, I drove here from my office on Richmond Road and just because you've passed a few chickens doesn't mean you're in rural India. Um, you know, obviously we're talking about, um, you know, the li life, be life beyond the cities and not really even the peri-urban environment, um, you know, and, and, and while there's the stereotype that, it, I don't know, maybe like a Bollywood film or something and you have a lot of people out staring at the sun, praying for rain uh, type of thing, and the, of course the rural areas are actually very uh, diverse places. Well, you know, I guess the Planning Commission estimates that half the people, half the income is earned uh, by, by farmers. The other half is extremely diverse and, and people are earning money doing lots of things, selling uh, mo uh, motorcycles and mobiles and um, infrastructure and finance and, and all kinds of different things. So it's certainly a very vibrant and very diverse uh, e economy. Um, just, just briefly by way of uh, background, as Srikanth mentioned, I, I run a company called Unitas Capital. We're an investment bank that focuses on raising money for socially impactful companies. So over the last 10 years, we've raised uh, a little over $2 billion for different Indian uh, companies, uh, all focused on impact, so ac across um, education, uh, a lot of it in financial inclusion, so microfinance, SME finance, that, that kind of thing, he healthcare, uh, women empowerment, uh, agriculture, uh, as well as renew renewable energy. Um, so I've gotten to work with a lot of fantastic entrepreneurs that, that have scaled their businesses quite well. Um, with, with that, I'll let uh, Mega and then Prashant uh, in introduce what they're doing. Hi, I uh, run a socially impactful organization, a social enterprise as we call it in India, a section eight company called Projectify. We work in the space of education. We've built uh, IP around a teacher-less learning model that we currently implement in about 18 geographies across India, Africa, and Pakistan. Uh, essentially taking away, uh, trying to solve the biggest problem currently, which is people who are in marginalized communities either do not have access to education system or have access to an education system that does not necessarily allow them to propel forward in life. So we tried to solve that problem. We started about two years ago and we currently have built a uh, IP process that we implement with partners and with uh, institutions that are looking to work with uh, people at the bottom of the pyramid. Thank you, Eric, and thank you, Mika. My name is Prashant. I am one of the co-founders of SMART. Smart is a s was founded as a social enterprise. It's a network of small Kirana stores 
in, in remote villages and small towns in rural Tamil Nadu and southern rural Karnataka. What we do is we provide last mile distribution services for these small Kirana stores, helping them improve their income by selling consumer durables. It started off with just six products like solar lanterns, water filters, clean cook stoves. And right now we sell more than 165 different SKUs through these small Kirana stores. So they range from different agricultural tools to pressure cookers to different kinds of uh, products that improve rural lifestyles. So we were founded uh, in 2012. We operate in through eight different distribution centers in uh, Tamil Nadu and Karnataka, as I had said. We're headquartered in Bangalore. Uh, we, we don't uh, use technology as a product. We use it as the backbone of our business. We run on a platform that we developed that helps us manage our logistics, keep a lean inventory, and service orders to our customers. Those are the shopkeepers. And uh, right now in our team, we have about 50 people working uh, mostly in islands remotely uh, in villages in India, and of which about six of us are based in Bangalore. Thank you very much. Excellent. So, you, so as you can see, um, we have uh, two, two entrepreneurs building very different businesses um, in, uh, in, in, in rural India, um, and, uh, and I, I think ad addressing challenging problems. So our, our panel is on winning in Bari. So I guess my first question um, to, to each of you is, one, do you feel that you are winning in, in Bari? And then if you are, what's allowing you to win? And, and to the extent that you're not, I'm sure you're committed to winning. And what, you know, what do you need to do to kind of, you know, really kind of prove that your business model is winning in, in rural India? So um, think like I said, so we started about two years ago and uh, the idea really was to see if uh, we were focused on wanting to change how education is being imparted right, to uh, the rural India and especially to uh, people who either drop out or actually never end up going to the system at all. So while we started as uh, you know, a pure play, very small experiment and saying this is going to be a social enterprise, what has definitely happened over the two years is that we very uh, quickly were able to come up with a service delivery model, which meant that for us, uh, from just a small experiment of can we build a teacher-less model that they will want to take up, uh, we started getting uh, approached by schools, by uh, people, uh, corporates who were working in these uh, segments wanting to really uh, look at what we had built to implement as part of skilling, as part of uh, really reaching to the last mile uh, people, the youth who they think they could bring in and really work with. So uh, for us, I think that was a good insight into how we have been able to move on and really build a business model around providing this as a service, which is, and for us this is interesting because we did not start out as a tech product. So this was not built as, you know, your regular ed tech products, right, which is whether the Baiju's or all of these. This was a process innovation that we wanted to do. This was about saying, can we change the way people are really learning? And uh, and therefore, I think for us that was a good stepping point, which was that we now have uh, organizations, institutions that want this and want to implement this as a service, which is where now mostly our organization is run from. And so, yeah, I think we are we've kind of already on the path of uh, really building this as a strong business, and therefore a winning model for us. Okay. Excellent. Um, certainly, I think to the extent you educate one kid, you could say you're winning and you've obviously educated many more than that. So, uh, Prashant? Uh, so that's an interesting question. It's something that we ask ourselves every month. Are we winning? We, uh, we certainly think so. And some, one of the things, I mean, two of the things that I'd like to talk about that uh, we think that we do efficiently so we can replicate our initial success when we started in one distribution center it's, and we think that uh, we did it consciously. Is one focus on a strong HR strategy? Uh, it may. It's most of the people like we work in small towns that are not uh, offering the best jobs for our youth. So it is likely that many of the hardworking people have moved to cities, and ambitious people have moved to cities. 
So a strong recruitment strategy is something that we constantly make sure that we uh, enforce in our distribution centers. And because people work independently, most of the time they're alone during the day visiting these shops and servicing orders, we need to keep them motivated and all the time engaged with the company itself. That is something else that defines uh, how we win on the field. And another thing that I think is very important, it was touch, touched upon a little bit in the uh, panel discussion too, like the one prior to the previous one, that you cannot see Bharat with a single market strategy. You need to see it with the diversity that it brings. Every district is very diverse from the other. Even if McDonald's had to open in villages, I don't think just an alu tiki burger or whatever would do. The level of spice would have to vary in every different district. Every, as you move from village to village, there are a lot of things that you need to pay a lot of attention with a degree of cultural sensitivity. And how we do that is have each distribution center, which operates with uh, six or seven employees, make certain decisions about how they handle their customers by themselves and put it down on paper in terms of what they do differently in terms of their region. That is something else that we see as an important part of our scaling strategy so that we can replicate the success, keeping in mind that we are dealing with, with, with a very diverse market. Terrific. Yeah, I think that is a critical point that um, you know, the, there's not one Barrett. There's so many of them, and it'd be so different across states and within states and within communities. Um, terrific. So, Mega, you do some work in Delhi as well, right? So you're doing some work in urban India, some work in rural India. How do you have to adjust what you're doing for those different environments? So I think our work primarily stays still the same, which is really providing the service to people who are at the bottom of the complete uh, pyramid, right? So even when we work in urban India, we do have some work also happening in Bangalore. But our impact audience remains the same, which is people who do not have access to learning systems. So when we work in urban India, we are still working with young people and young adults coming from the slums. And uh, these are still, so you, we might have the perception that you know, while they live in urban India, they have better access to, let's say, uh, internet. And they have better access to, therefore, uh, learning systems on the internet, but the reality remains that uh, even within the urban sector, they still do not have necessarily have control over the internet that they can have access to, because there is only one person in the house who holds the phone, and therefore our model therefore does not uh, necessarily differentiate and does not require a absolutely differentiated approach, because uh, in a rural uh, state as well as in an urban state. The children who are accessing this are exactly are at the same starting point. So they are still struggling with uh, going to schools that do not cater to their needs and or are struggling with not being able to afford going to even those schools. So I think that remains fundamentally very similar for us when we intervene. And therefore, I think it's been uh, the process also therefore has was created that it can replicate itself in these kind of uh, circumstances from a city, rural, peri-urban for that matter. So I think because of the impact audience we work with, um, we don't necessarily find a lot of difference. What we do find is the next step, which is once we've created the intervention, once um, the model has been implemented, what do they do with it post that is where we find the differentiation, is where we see a young adult in Bangalore very quickly assimilating and becoming a freelance designer for that matter who would have probably otherwise dropped out of the whole working economy whereas in rural we will see them uh, becoming entrepreneurs so we see a shift in that we see in rural they would rather stay there and and they would rather small start something small and quickly start uh, you know uh, bringing money back into the family so we see changes in the outcomes, but what we don't have to shift around is with the model that we implement. Yeah, excellent. I, th I think, yeah, that's, it's useful to see that you don't have to change your product so much because you're, you're focused on your client's needs. And in this case, the client's needs are very similar. Um, but I think you also bring up a, a, a good point in terms of 
people in rural areas, many of them wanting to stay there. So I, I've seen other businesses where they've done some kind of um, training to make people employable, and they'll do that in the city, and then they'll get them a job at Cafe Coffee Day or wherever it is, and after, and that's, and they're making whatever seven, eight thousand a month, and and the, they think they should be happy with that, and they're like, no, I'd rather go back to my village and make significantly less. And so it's one of those things that it can actually be a strategic advantage for your business if you're like, there's been. Um, BPO companies that have been set up in rural areas, um, rural shores and others, and they see that they have much less employee turnover than you'd have in an, inver uh, than an urban environment because there's fewer options for, em for employment in those areas and people want to stay um, in, in those areas. And so, um, Brajant, you've been operating for quite some time now. Um, what, what other business models have you seen ar around you that, that have really done well and scaled well in, in Bharat and in rural India? So, uh, some of the businesses that we see do well are connected with the physical mobile phones, their distribution model, something comparable with uh, our model, and more so with sugary soft drinks like Coca Cola and Pepsi and fast moving consumer goods. If you have to see a, a product that has reached every village in India, it's probably the toothpaste and the shampoo. It's also something that Indians buy in small quantities only and uh, already know that they're going to buy it before they reach the shop. So it's a little different from uh, our business where we need to add two different aspects to it to actually demonstrate the use of the product before it and guarantee that the product is going to work to actually earn the trust of uh, the customer who's coming in. So what we do is try to use the similar operating costs and uh, logistics and add the element of technology to it. Like for example, our logistics system allows for backward flow of goods so that if a product is returned, we can actually take it back uh, into the system and uh, allow for the billing uh, to be reworked in that way. Also, it allows for things like working offline, things like that, that are particular to rural areas that uh, is handled through telephone usually, but not on a technology platform. So we've tried to use the same strategy that you find these small products in every village in India. And the one thing that exists in every village in India, it may not always be a post office, but there's always a small village shop which sells these products. So, and what we've augmented to it is basically information di dissemination and after-sales service, which uh, has helped us uh, earn a certain degree of trust uh, as against any other, like uh, more than a mobile phone retailer, for example. Terrific, yeah, I think you, you highlighted a number of the businesses that have been quite successful. Obviously, the, the, the consumer-based products like Coca-Cola or the little Hindustan lever sachets, you, people have really innovated. To, to have very profitable and very large businesses. Obviously, ITC has done the same. Amol is a great example of a, of a business. You've, you've had multiple financial services companies. Um, Bandan Bank out of Kolkata has done spectacularly well um, with a largely uh, a rural model. Um, Bharat Financial, which was SKS, I think for quite some time was the largest. It's it's a, it's a, it's a un, untalked about unicorn company, as is Bandan is a multi-multi. Uh, Unicorn and uh, SKS for a while was the largest mobile phone seller in the country in addition to being a very successful microfinance company also sells lots of off-grid solar lanterns and, and other products that are that are that are strongly um, in in need um, so I'll ask one more question and then I'll open it up to the audience for for, for questions after that mega you you set your company up as a section 8 company I, b I believe and what was the thinking behind doing that and I, and I think Prashant you have not you've set up as a, a normal a normal uh, private limited uh, company it'd be interesting to hear why why you've each made those decisions so I'm a mechanical engineer that used to work in a big French multinational and uh, my other co-founders come from academic and NGO backgrounds and this was a conscious decision that we took to actually set up as a private limited company. One, because what we wanted to do was to emulate the urban work ethic, where people come and have to work hard to actually pay their monthly bills, to actually 
do that, which may not be the case in rural India. Many of them are supported by their family and not necessarily need to make money consistently every month, but may prefer to make it uh, on during the agricultural season, things like that. So what we wanted to do is set up an employee culture where everybody has a very uh, strong work ethic where uh, we actually have to strive hard to uh, meet certain targets and goals to actually be able to scale over a period of time. We always thought of ourselves as a bigger company than we were, even when we started, uh, which is one of the reasons. And even if you look at other legal aspects, as in at that time it was a VAT registration, now a GST registration, getting any compliance uh, with local tax, I mean local sales tax, different varieties. It's easier to do it as a private limited company and uh, also to raise money, very importantly. <laughs> it was easier to justify uh, uh, our scale with a profitable, like because we had a profitable model, it, was, it wouldn't have been easy to say that we are an NGO that wants to be in every village in India because we want to. What we wanted to do is create some a platform, a distribution network which would be able to take any product. It could be a product that is not yet uh, made. It could be an innovation that is not yet made. It could be a low-cost washing machine. It could be a low-cost dishwasher that every uh, rural citizen wants to aspire and have it available in every shop in India. It may not have to be stocked over there, but people should be able to order it over there. And we wanted that uh, large thinking to be watered down into every employee of us, which is why we set up at something that uh, something that would be able to scale and uh, be sustainable over a very long period. I think for us it was a very straight thing. Uh, we had three co-founders who all came from uh, social impact backgrounds. And for us, uh, we wanted to set up a Section 8 because we were driven by our own passion of saying that we want to have something in which we, we will make money, there will be profits that will be generated, but we wanted to go back into the organization. And uh, and we, again, wanted to set up a standard of exactly work ethics, a vision value, which was that as founders, we wanted to be driven by, you know, uh, what is it that as tomorrow when we exit and we have somebody else leading it, uh, it's driven by, you know, what is it at which uh, the leadership can really uh, take home and what is it that the employees can and so I think we were driven by what will new age thinking of changing global problems look like and so we stuck to and we deliberated this quite a bit within the founding team of uh, do we do a private limited do we do an LLP or uh, we definitely did not want to do an uh, trust and all of that and then we came down to we will Section 8 because it's still driven by huge corporate compliance, absolutely like a private limited. You, It's the absolute compliance that you will follow, so you will have that on you. But what it will give us is this uh, whole system of giving uh, everything that comes out, the profits that come out, going back into it. And I think that's where we were driven from. And also because uh, we were two years ago not fundamentally at a stage where we are going to create a tech product, right? We were going to be working with clients who were severely marginalized and uh, delivering a process innovation. And at we had talked about it that at some point when we think we are ready to come out with a tech product is when we will think about whether now we need to set up a LLP or a private limited company to do it. But to begin with, uh, we wanted to really uh, go with a Section 8 for really driving higher compliance and change also the narrative around how nonprofits work. So I think it was also that for us. Fantastic. Um, we have time for a question or two. Please uh, fire away. Anyone? possible for someone to build a very large successful business with literally like not much of tech. Yeah, I think I can take that. So um, 
we literally work with, uh, we've built absolutely no tech. We have built no technology. We have not built, we were in education. Um, even from content perspective, we build no content, right? And I think we were driven by this question a lot that, and considering we live in Bangalore, that you know, if we want to really change the way education works, does it mean we build an app? Does it mean we become content aggregators? Should we do this or that? Uh, but we we pure play work on um, in rural India, especially what is the technology that's available, right? So our model is very less tech dependent, and is uh, simply because it's uh, you do not one you do not have as much tech penetration in rural as we think it is. To um, the usage of it is still very highly segmented. Uh, you still do not, there is one owner of that tech and therefore women can't access it as much, young children can't access it as much and therefore uh, we definitely have built a business which is pure play non-tech and is trying to really leverage shared tech. So when we go to rural India, whatever technology is available there, whether in CSCs or whether in the community spaces that are run there, uh, and the shared tech that can be leveraged to change. So yeah, we are definitely an example. Yeah, I mean, I would, I would give one other example. Bandan Bank, which is out of Calcutta, has been extraordinarily successful. We started working with them more than 10 years ago, and we, went, we helped them trans, uh, transfer from being a nonprofit, actually, into a for-profit and raised equity for them for the first time nine years ago. At that time, they had no computers in their branches. They, they literally, no tech. Um, they, their, their employees didn't have mobile phones that they're going around, they're just entering everything into log books. There was huge skepticism from the venture capital and private equity community in them. How can you run a business like that? Since then, the business has scaled to you know, massive scale. They, when they became a bank a few years ago, they've, they've onboarded new, um, new, 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 cl new, cl new clients in, in terms of putting down deposits at rates dramatically faster than Kotak did, or Yes Bank, or RBL, all of which are um, fantastic banks. Um, you know, so they, 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 of course, they use some technology now, but they've always been very low tech focused and, and have scaled better than anyone else in the financial services space. So, Megha, this question is for you. So uh, currently, what we uh, what we are doing is so when we set this up, one our one of our biggest revenue model, like I said, this provided as a service is with partners. So uh, public schools, government schools that are in rural areas, organizations that are already working there with this segment of people are looking at skilling, and are looking at really providing livelihood options, etc. For them, our peop our organizations who we work with and provide a process innovation. That's one aspect. Second is when we set it up in rural areas, it's it's literally like a center model, right? So there are people who don't end up paying and are not able to afford coming here. Then uh, there are people who use this and are able to quickly find jobs and are able to really uh, find livelihoods for themselves. And there's a give back model, wherein they put back money once they are themselves into livelihoods and are able to sustain the center and are able to do that from the perspective of providing back for people who can't. So there is that value system that is created with every intervention we make in terms of, and it is, it is, a, it is a margin we make based on the partner who we are working with, where there is a timeline of what will they keep paying for till they have everybody there who's able to find jobs for themselves and do that. But currently, most of our revenues are coming as fees from uh, the partners who pretty much take on the cost, which could be a school in terms of government schools when we work with them, or it could be uh, the other nonprofits or private companies also who are based in these uh, locations and are looking to change the way they are able to work with their communities. And that's what, how we work. Great. Well, thank you all very much. Appreciate it. Um, yeah, patient. Appreciate you being patient.
can stay on for Vineet, who's really the father of this industry. Thank you very much, Eric. Eric, we have a small token of a